that, that, that's what we've got to do. We've got to change. And unless we have that discussion, all the rest of this stuff is just no more than just the same old crap. Mm -hmm. It's going to have the same old impact, and we're going to do the same old stupid things about trying to address it until we get people a ability to have the cash to get what they want. That's what I believe. You know, I say it all the time. I say, that's my message. And people should always tell me that I was, you know, or oh, you, you know. Uh, but when, when, I, when, I was, when I was at HUD, the thing people invite, I should speak across the country because I tell people the truth. This is a stupid move. And this is what you're going to be doing about it. And somebody said, how can you do that and work for HUD? I said, because they know when, I go, when they send me out there, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say what they're afraid to say. They know they won't say it. You know, and do you want to fire me for that? Fine. But uh, until we have that kind of thinking and activity and people start, and, and these meetings that come together, let's talk about something real. Most of these meetings, we spend thousands of dollars sending people to go to these workshops and conferences, and what do they do? They waste our money. They do. They go have a good time. They don't spend no time doing the work of talking in groups about how we can begin to change these policies and how, we, how can we address HUD, how can we build a critical mass of community advocacy. They're not having that discussion. And definitely not having it in the communities. Okay, so I told Ed this. <laughs> not only are the contractors coming from someplace else, but they're bringing the labor force from someplace else. Exactly. So the unions here, the two people here, the, the, the youngsters here who could benefit from learning the skills of building, taking gutting houses and sheetrocking and carpentry and everything else that would leave them with, with skills and, and jobs and employment. Even now, when we got 10 years or more worth of building to do in this city, it's being outsourced to other people and immigrant labor and everything else but people here. And see, in the city, the, the, the Department of Labor requires the creation of a workforce investment board. Okay, uh, the WIB. And what they do, all the federal money that comes from the Labor Department comes through this group that decides upon how to allocate funds for employment training. Mm -hmm. So anything that's being done over here, for example, with these developers and others who are building and needing labor and workforce, there'll be a requirement that they've got to submit their plans to this group that defines how training dollars are going to be trained. So if I know two years from now you're going to need 10 sheet walkers and, and 30 many block bricklayers and so many of this, you see what I'm saying, to do that job, why shouldn't they be allocating this money to make sure those people are trained to do that work? Which they have the authority to do. But nobody, but, but nobody they forces it to happen. The fashion stuff that they were doing forever and ever that hasn't been... Exactly. And, and, and that they connect with the school system, okay? So the school system is building in a voc vocational education program that many of them had. A lot of people who came into our factories and also came through a vocational educational program. They didn't go to college. They learned bricklaying. They learned sheet metal. They learned all that right in school. And so if they connected to that, to the school system, and, and understood what their employment requirements for the next five years, we could develop the workforce that could meet the employment needs of these people who come in to do these new projects. You see what I'm saying? Unless we coordinate that, that doesn't happen. They bring labor from outside. Um, maybe it may be a premature time to talk about it, but I just wanted to know what you thought about what Ed Blakely was kind of proposing to, um, not proposing, that sounds strong, um, to Richard about, you know, like his plan of, you know, grocery store liquor thing that he was talking about. Do you remember? Yeah, I do remember. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> I want to hear, I want to hear what he said. What he said was this. He says that, he was talking about the whole area around the need for us to really provide healthy food to people in communities. And in a lot of cases, the grocery stores that are in some of these neighborhoods are not providing healthy food, but in fact, they are selling liquor. And they are becoming places where people aggregate for other kind of negative behavior in the community. And so there, for example, if you have a guy who is a small business merchant and he is making $50,000 a year, and he's making $40,000 off, off of selling liquor for example and we say we want you to do something else and if he goes into another business and he only makes twenty five thousand dollars we will keep make him whole we'll give him the subsidy for the fifteen thousand dollars and make sure that he doesn't have an economic loss because we've forced him to move out of selling liquor for example instead he's going to sell groceries 
He's going to sell fresh food. He's going to sell that. That's what he, that that's people what's... may not buy. Huh? That, that people may not buy if they're going to buy the liquor. Right. Exactly. Else, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, but that's that's a, that's, a, that's his cut. So we're going to subsidize that. Now, I can tell you that that strategy will last as long as Ed Blakely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it will last as long as Ed Blakely. He may find some money to do something like that, but somebody else would view that as crazy, and then he would never sustain that. That is a non-sustainable strategy.